It's the Carrison Price for Thursday, April 4th, 2024. We're coming to you from the Nation Network studio built by Arbor Lee here at the iconic Wall Center. And if you don't know about the Constellation floor, a 34th floor meeting space, absolutely gorgeous outdoor patio, panoramic views, downtown Vancouver, the mountains, the ocean. Contact the team to learn more. Sales at wallcenter.com. Matt Sikaris alongside Blake Price, Grace Sassett and Switches conducting things. Big show coming up is all brought to you. By Applewood Auto Group. Applewood Nissan in Surrey, the 2024 Rogues. Go take one for a test drive. You'll love it. Lease it at 2.99% for 24 months. Uh, it's that rare vehicle, fits into parking spaces, and yet seemingly has enough cargo space to take everything you need in the uh, the back as well. Go take one for a test drive now at Applewood Nissan in Surrey. It's all good at Applewood. Whole question today asking you, who is the Canucks MVP? Quinn Hughes, JT Miller. You can vote at Sikerson Price on Twitter and YouTube, and I don't like JT's chances. No, there's a lot of momentum right now for the, mm-hmm. the little man. But like, I, I do believe Miller deserves a shout here because of the way he has played, particularly post-All-Star so break. So consistent. He's been the guy yeah. night in, night out, performing, producing when others have gone quieter, including Quinn Hughes yep. for a spell. Yep. So if you're looking for like sort of consistency of season, JT Miller might have been their most consistent player. He might end up being a victim of recency bias is a little bit like it's probably 50 50, but because Hughes is finishing up so strong, I think that might tip the scales. Well, not only finishing up so strong, but likely to lead the defense scoring race. Although Gil McCarr has to say on that and finishing second in team scoring. He has moved past Elias Patterson. Yeah. He is up to 86 points. Quinn Hughes, 85 for PD. Now, I do think Miller will still get to 100. He's got six games left here and needs I hope four he does. points. Yeah. yeah, I mean, especially after the narrow miss of 99, That's right? right? Yeah. Him and him and Brock, I mean, you got to get to those and plateaus. And Brock to 40, two yeah. goals away from 40. Oaklander, two goals away from 25. That yeah. would be interesting. And Hronik of, course, Hronik, of course, three points away from 50. Uh, we'll get into We'll get into more of that. In a second, but the other thing is, you know, Quinn is now a terrific defender as well. And if you take a look at the Vancouver Canucks and their recipe for success, and we have been saying this now for a couple of months, despite all the goals early in the season when they were blowing teams out, when that power play was really cooking, um, they have morphed into a more defensive outfit, a team that has to win lower scoring games. And Quinn Hughes, of course, with the time that he plays, 24 minutes and 44 seconds per night, more than a minute uh, in excess of his nearest teammate, Philip Ronick. Um, He's been a massive reason why as well, even with the starting goaltender going down, right? And the backup goaltender having to come in and play, well, two backups having to come in and play the last 10 games. It was a, a Mona Lisa performance for him again against the Coyotes for Quinn Hughes. And he has just decided to take it to another level. And I, I think it's in response to what he sees happening around him, where I think he feels like he needs to do more. And so he is. And, um, you know, as amazing as Pedersen can be at times, as amazing as Miller is, he's just so strong and shot is so good. Um, if you're looking for the jaw-dropping player, I mean, the Canucks might have their first skilled jaw-dropping player since Bure. The twins were jaw-dropping together. Mm-hmm. Um, but as an individual talent, yeah, you're talking. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. his ability to... And we've never seen this player because Bure was straight ahead speed more than anything else. Uh, I, I'd always wanted the Canucks to have the edge work kind of, I mean, Connor McDavid watching him last night too, before the game began, I mean, at speed, he's doing a lot of the same sort of things. Uh, it's just fun to watch. He's just, Quinn Hughes is just so damn fun yeah, to is. watch. And, and I'm just so happy for Canucks fans that they get to see this kind of oh, a player well, wearing we, their uniform we on a nightly f- basis. We waited 50 years for yeah. this player in this month. But I don't care if it's a defenseman you know, or a forward. And the mm-hmm. fact that it's a defenseman, and okay. that was that was even even more of a drought. Um, well, I do. Yeah. But <laughs> I, I do because you can get these forwards in and they have an impact, but they don't help you win like the defenseman does. 
Well, that's the thing. Like, there's been a lot of pirouette forwards that, like, a, like a Jeff Skinner, who's got great edge work, but he's not a superstar player. Um, the ones that take it to the superstar level, whether it be forward or defense, I mean, they're just they're marvels, and he's he's an absolute freaking marvel right now. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't have got the win last night without him. They just thought I wouldn't have. Right, which brings us to our top story, brought to you by Douglas Coyote Ugly. Not the most artistic game down in the desert at their itty bitty arena, but a 2 1 Vancouver Canucks victory, one that they absolutely needed coming off the loss in Vegas and really took a spanking at the hands of the Golden Knights. Look, still haven't beaten a playoff team since early March in the Winnipeg Jets, but with the schedule now so deep, just picking off enough wins to win the Pacific division. And that is also part of the storyline in our top story. Yeah. Not absolutely. Certainly not a Mona Lisa that uh, we're going to remember this game, but an important one because it gets them that much closer to the Pacific division crown. Now seven up on Edmonton who gets shellacked by Dallas Oilers with two in hand. And of course the head to head, but it's going to be exceedingly difficult for Edmonton to catch Vancouver now. I know you were looking at some of the math and some of the three and three for the Canucks. Box. Three and three for the Canucks forces the Oilers to go seven and one. Mm -hmm. So the most mediocre and and three and three, uh, NHL wise, that that's not a good team. Like three and three is like that's not a good rate. So Canucks merely need to go three and three to force the Oilers to go seven and one with that head to head. Now everybody's seen the head to head. Oh, that's a huge benefit for the Oilers. It's a huge benefit for the Canucks too because. If the Oilers got red hot again, you still got the ace in the, in the hole of you beat them that one time, mm -hmm. and all you have to do is win two other games and you're in. Yeah, uh, you're the, your top spot. So, uh, ninety four point five percent according to to Money Puck right now mm -hmm. for the Canucks to finish first in the Pacific. They're off to Los Angeles to finish this road trip against the Kings on Saturday, then home for the rematch with Vegas on Monday, and yet again these Arizona Coyotes on Wednesday of next week at Rogers Arena before the big showdown in Edmonton, which, hey, maybe there's a world where that game is meaningless. Yeah. Canucks can win all, win three straight here and the Oilers scuffle a little. Maybe there's no there there. I mean, absolutely. If the, if the Canucks get a little bit of help, can I, uh, the Oilers play Friday, Saturday. If the Oilers scuffle a bit and the Canucks win three in a row, it is it won't be necessarily mathematically over, but it'll be pretty darn close to be mathematically over. It might even, might even be mathematically over. Um, right. so, so it's, it's right there for the Vancouver Canucks now. And we're going to get into this throughout the course of the show. Great that they are this close now to getting that sort of thing filed away. Now they got to play better hockey. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, tell us about our friends at Douglas, and we'll move on. Still haven't unboxed my uh, my Douglas. Uh, I'm I need some I need some guidance there on which bed this is going to be attached mm -hmm. to. Who gets the benefit of the Who Douglas? Who gets the new mattress? Yes, uh, you can order yours today. At Douglas.ca slash Canucks Army, and what it is is Canada's best mattress according to Canadian Living. That's right, named Canada's best mattress on Canadian living. So would, doesn't that sound enticing for you? And every mattress comes with a free comfort sleep bundle. So you get two memory foam pillows with pillow protectors, luxurious cotton sheet set, and one mattress protector free with any mattress order. So again, order yours today. Douglas.ca slash Canucks Army, handcrafted in Canada and ensuring the highest quality materials, fastest delivery right to your doorstep. So Quinn Hughes with a two-point night, a goal, and an assist. As mentioned, he moves past Elias Patterson in club scoring. Let's hear from the head coach. Oh, she also mentioned this. Up to 70 assists yep. on the season. The second Vancouver Canuck to do that. The only other guy who's done it is one of the great setup men in the history of the National Hockey League, Henrik Sedin. Hank did it three different times, so 6 07, 2010, 2011, and then, of course, his virtuoso 09, 2010 season when he won the Hart Trophy, 83 that year. Wow. But one more assist, and Hughes goes, uh, ties Hank, so he, he could be number three on this list. Hell, if he has a heck of a final six games, 
he might even surpass Hank's 75 assists from 2010-2011. Carl, so, Carlson and Yossi are the active defensemen who have done it. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, it hadn't been done since Brian Leach in 95-96. Right. So uh, a sensational season for Quinn Hughes, and let's hear from the head coach, Rick Tockett, on his captain. Yeah, I think Huggy played really well tonight. You know, he... Uh... He was uh, he was moving his feet all night. I mean, he you know he controlled a lot of the play. You know, it was obviously a great play on the, on the Garland goal. Yeah, sets up Connor Garland. More about him in a in a moment. And that was on his second sort of um, insurgence uh, in, mm -hmm. in on that play. He tried something himself, then did the the whole circle of the offensive zone, and then sets up Garland. I mean, it was just magical. Just before we go any further, because I mentioned Pedersen a couple times, he does get a point last night, a second assist on the power play goal yeah. by Hughes. So he snaps the four-game pointless streak and, of course, takes a hellacious hit from Jack McBain. What did you make of Petey? Um, better, but still not yeah, a... Yeah, yeah. I mean, still... I, I felt like he was trying, which makes it almost more concerning because it's like he, he's not floating... I can see him trying, but there's just nothing happening. Like, it's just not there for him. And that's almost more concerning that I'd rather he was just floating so you could just sort of try to wake him up. But I, I think he is trying, and it's just not there. It's just not coming together for him. So, yeah. Evan on YouTube says, Pedersen looks like he's sleeping on a Doug Douglas mattress <laughs> most nights. Thank you for the attempt, and Douglas uh, yeah. appreciates it. Uh, let's talk Arthur Shelofs for a second here. The young Latvian goaltender making his six, second start of the season, of course, won the game Sunday, Easter Sunday against Anaheim at Rogers Arena. This one on the road, and hey, I'll tell myself I'm wrong. I was wondering whether they were going to hook to Smith early in Vegas to come back with him as the starter, but they have confidence in Shilovs, and he uh, returned it. Yeah, yeah, he validated it. Twenty of 21 saves to post a second consecutive victory five and two in his NHL career, two ninety three goals against nine thirteen save percentage took a power play goal too, to get past. Yeah. Him. I mean, and, and look for the opening 40 minutes, he was not very busy. No seven shots. That's why we say coyote ugly boy. The, you know, sort of the third period of the Vegas game was low event. This one was low event. But then but then they give up a glorious chance yeah. and you have to go post to post to make yeah. a stop. So this is one of those. Uh so let's hear from Rick Tockett on his young backup goaltender. I mean, even some shots and the rebounds, he's right there. Like for the you know, he's not flipping and flopping, like he's right there. You know, he uh, looks like he's been watching Demco tapes. That's uh you know, he's there on the second the rebound. So uh yeah, that's a obviously he's a two really good games for us from us uh, for the Arthur pretty un pretty unflappable too he doesn't look like he gets no. flustered in there it looks like he feels comfortable even mm -hmm. at the highest level we said that last year when we saw him and he certainly looked the part at the world championships where he was the uh, tournament MVP for Latvia underpinned their success there with an incredible performance a couple things to add number one that's got to be music to Ian Clark's ears when he hears the head coach say, oh, it looks like Demko. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's a, you know, Ian Clark walks strutting around. Pushing him into the yeah, cookie cutter. Connor McGregor <laughs> strut from, from Ian Clark after that's our number three goaltender and the head coach is going, yeah, it reminds me of the starter. and Vezina finalist. A lot of similarities there. Like you don't see him over sliding. You no. don't see him, mm -hmm. you know, um, scrambling around his crease like we've seen Casey DeSmith do a lot recently. So the Ian mm -hmm. Clark effect is alive and well. So let me ask both of you this, and I'll include you, Grady goalie guy. Hmm. Is Archer Silovs going to be the backup goaltender next year? Do you still feel like you need a veteran backup to Thatcher Demko, or are we prepared? Because we were having this discussion last year and through the summer, and frankly into September before the Casey DeSmith trade. So I'm going to change my answer because there's two there's two ways to answer this: should and will. And the should is they shouldn't. Uh, another year or two of Casey DeSmith probably be just fine. Well, he's so, UFA and going to get a raise, yeah. Blake. So, yeah. you know, you're either on the market looking for another Casey DeSmith, either via trade or uh, or in free agency. No. So here's the here's the thing. 
Like but, dismiss a 1.8 cap hit, and I think he's going to get a raise from that when you look at the numbers. Yeah, so that age, he may have priced himself yeah, out. I mean, he's 32 as well. If he's happy where he is, I, I don't. I, I think you might be able to get him at two, but but it's immaterial for me because I don't think right now the Canucks are in a place where they can devote that money to the backup goaltender. The Canucks are going to have to take a few risks next year to try to run it back, to try to be a good team again next year. They're going to lose some players. Fair. And if they can save, um, let's just go with the current numbers. Let's like just pretend you could get Casey D. Smith for another 1.8 next year. Probably can't, but let's let's go with this. Let's call it two. But you can probably get Archer Shelos for 900K. You know, um, get you know, get Shelos on a two-year deal at 900 per. And you're saving yourself a million dollars on the cap. That's a that's a valuable million bucks on the cap that is good. It's already spent. I mean, it's already spent on the other players that the Canucks have either extended already or are going to have to extend. So, I think for the purposes of the cap, yeah, Shilovs can be the goal, the uh, the backup goaltender next year. Even though I would rather steep him one more year mm. down to the minors, Grady. Yeah, I tend to agree with Blake. I'm just looking at the AHL numbers. Like he's kind of splitting duties in Abbotsford with Tolapilo as is. So do you want him to get those workhorse minutes again in the AHL? I think he's kind of capped out what he is at that level. And you see it a lot uh, with younger goalies is that they actually perform almost better in the NHL because the game's more structured. There's um, more predictability. Yeah. yeah so. Yeah. I think he's at the point now where he's really showing you some signs dating back to last year that he can handle uh, being a backup. Now, can he do it at the level that DeSmith has done this year in terms of reps? Uh, is Demko going to be injured again last year like like he has in previous years? So I would so I would lean to Seal- Shilovs, but also I think they should probably add kind of a third, fourth string, a Spencer veteran. Martin type yes, yes. as a safety blanket. So, so yes. th- that brings me to my follow-up. And, and first of all, don't overspend. It's 90 total AHL games, including playoffs for Shilovs. Yeah, that's not a lot. That's capped out. Oh boy, that's not a lot. Like no. pre-pandemic, we would have said, oh, he absolutely needs another. And year. that's why I said I'm accustomed to seeing some of these low participation rates because of compromised seasons. And that's why I say I would steep him another year, all things being equal. But the Canucks are up against it. And they're right. going to have to cheat next season because of, you know, the OEL money and all the extensions. So right. they're going to have so to cheat. So that, that's my follow-up here because you look at the numbers with Tolapilo and they're almost identical. That's right. So he's okay. So you bring in a Spencer Martin. So, no, Well, yeah, a Spencer Martin to be your number four. Right. Yep. And you let Tolapilo and Shilofs battle it out to see who's well. going to be the backup. Plus, if you get worried about sitting a 23-year-old goaltender for too long, you send him down to the farm. He goes, plays a bunch of games. And I'll have for You call up the other guy. The other 23-year-old. and caddy. Because yeah. the thing, Tolapilo's right. 23 too. So you can give Tolapilo a couple looks next year. Mm-hmm. You can do that, you know, the same way you're doing it with Shilovs. Mm-hmm. When you're at home and you know Tolapilo's down the road, just mm-hmm. yank him up and, and see what he, especially if you didn't like the last couple starts for Shilov. So right. uh, you got two 23-year-olds who are tracking nicely. Use them both as the backup. Indeed. Now, maybe they look at that, well, they want Tolapilo to take the lion's share of starts in Abbotsford well, next year. Well, he'll still year. get them. So he'll still t- get them. If you're talking about a guy who needs a lot more seasoning, I would suspect that's Tolapilo. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, Shilov's had 44 games last year, right. and now they Delia and Martin were so, shuffling in and out. 33 this year. He's not getting to 44. So mm-hmm. how much more does he really – like a strong playoff run down yeah. in Abbey? Are they going to split the duties? I mean, that's probably a telltale sign as well, mm-hmm. how they shape that up. Um. But, but so we've I'm seen... just saying, to, uh, 31 games in the AHL for Tolapilo did play professional in Sweden. There's a handful yeah. of KHL games in there as well, but he hasn't played the sort of. Um, I mean, Shilovs has played now against some top competition in the NHL and at the World Championships, mm-hmm. right? So, and he beat Casey DeSmith last year in that World Champ. I think it was the finals against uh, Team USA, where he outdueled Casey DeSmith there. So. I I've always thought the backup goalie is such an underrated part of building out a team, but there's a fine line of how much really do you want to spend on the position? And again, this is not when a team, the results could be, you know, this is not a team with a ton of fertile ground, you know, where yeah. they get to make these kinds of decisions. Like, yes, is it an underrated position? Yeah, it might be. 
but they ain't got time to deal with that next no. year. They just, they just don't. So if they've got a reasonable way to get a, effectively a free backup goaltender, mm-hmm. and at 900K, that would be mm-hmm. a free backup goaltender, mm-hmm. then I think you have to go with Technically, it. he looks ready to make the jump. So. And uh, good show, Grady. Uh, Latvia over Team USA for bronze. For bronze. For bronze. Right. Yeah. You know who won gold, Grady. That's right. You know who won gold. <laughs> I should look at back of my betting slips from the world championship to remind myself. You know you're a degenerate when you're betting on the world championships. No, no, no. Well, we, got, we knew that before you that. Got caught, no. You got caught up. You're you're part of Archer's army. You saw how the Canucks goalie was performing at the Worlds, and you said, I know something here. I have insight that the other punters don't have. And you rode with them all the way to bronze. Connor Garland. He scores a goal against his former club, of course, the Arizona Coyotes. And in fact, I'm I'm not sure who tweeted. I don't have that in front of me, but whoever tweeted, well, Dylan Gunther scored, so Connor Garland has to score now. And sure enough, three minutes later, uh, sorry, uh, seven minutes later, seven and change. Uh, Gunther, of course, was taken with the draft pick that Vancouver traded Arizona in the Oliver Ekman, Larson, Connor Garland trade. And, uh, look, uh, you, me and, and Ray Ferraro all loved him coming out of that Canadian world juniors, just sort of knew where to be and where to, where not to be in terms of goal scoring. He's up to 13 goals. I mean, he's, uh, I think he's going to be a, a decent player, but mm-hmm. Garland now at 16 goals. And how about this? He played 19 minutes last night, yeah. just shy of. Like, Connor Garland averages 14 and change for the Vancouver Canucks. 14-19 is what Garland averages. And last night, Connor Garland plays 18 minutes and 58 seconds. Is he getting too much praise to be the unsung hero of this team of late? No, but it's about deployment. He was yeah. he's been deployed in the bottom six for much of this. So how, mm-hmm. how much ink he gets is sort of immaterial. It's yeah. it's you know the opportunity given, which is not to say he's got three well, power play points. What I'm saying points. is he's forging a, a little more uh, ice time here. But look yeah. when he he goes with Miller, he goes goal. with Joshua, he goes with Pedersen. Mm-hmm. Talk, it's using him kind of as the spring to That's get others right. going. That's so. what I'm saying. And, and, and that give and go with Joshua too. Like yeah. he's a center from the wing in a lot of ways. In a lot of ways, yeah. he's a play I think driver. that's what t- took. I think that's what confused and befuddled and made it difficult for him to fit with line mates in the past, as they just didn't really realize. Yes, he's that pass first creating winger, which is why if if Lindholm does come back, if you're going to use three centers and Lindholm's one of them, mm-hmm. maybe you give him Garland and Joshua, so right. that so it's a legit line. Like mm-hmm. you got the yeah. superstars up top, they should be able to make something more of the of the better players. But maybe Garland gets Lindholm going. It's six straight games now too, where Garland has exceeded his average time on ice, so. Very good trend line right there. He's got a four four game point streak going. But go down as in game fact, log. he's got he's got seven points in the last eight. He, points his, in seven of eight. Yeah. So no. No, his uh, his game log, his his trend line right now is looking fantastic. And I mean, we said it earlier in the season when that great third line was going with Bluger and Joshua. You know, where would they be without Connor Garland? This was a guy who on day one of the season was having to take questions about a trade request. I think he's a point per game in the last 14. And it's funny because he could come in with less points than he had last year. And everyone was like, oh, this is an immovable contract. But it just shows you that well, you can't just look at points and context and couple underlying things. metrics all factors. Number in. one, he's one goal away from uh, the 17 he scored yeah. last year. Yeah. As a cuck. It was 19 in his first year, actually, in 52 points. He's not going to get there. Only the third time he's been to 40 points, but, all with the Canucks. But also, remember he had a hat trick in game 82 yes, last against year. against Arizona. So, like, a the meaningless... <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Well, I covered I'm the so Blue happy Jays. those days are done. Covered the Blue Jays. They used to call them Jesse Barfields. Like, the home run when it's 8-1, one yeah. way or the other. Yeah. 
Who you know, cares? Gar- Garland had a few Barfields last year. Towards Are you season. litigating Barfield garbage home runs time? Forty oh, no. years later, yeah. the backdoor cover to ruin your spread. I'm just saying, Blake, that there were there are some sluggers that go up there when the score is out of hand. Yeah, and they're not getting cheated with their rips. Jays could use a Barfield they're right now. Swinging from the heels. Ooh. Let's see this one leave the yard. Make it a two or nine one. Anyways, let's hear from the head coach on Connor Garland and the win. It was good. It was, you know, I thought we defended really well. It was a grindy type of game. You know what I mean? Uh, it was a big goal by Garza. I mean, he loves this building. He, he, he loves coming here. Well, he loves the city. Well, he loves, he loves yeah. facing the fridge. I'm Mullen not sure arena. anybody loves the building. No. Certain, certainly Ian McIntyre doesn't. Really? Yeah. I haven't heard it less than a thousand times. <laughs> Baseball's got a mullet arena now. Did you see that today? Mm-hmm. Sacramento. <laughs> Here come the A's, baby. They've got their own mullet arena. Mm. The Sacramento Athletics doesn't quite roll off the well, top. We'll get off this topic in a second, but the owner of the A's coming out and saying, I saw that. I can't wait to see Aaron Judge come here and hit a home run. <laughs> Aaron Judge doesn't play for them, folks. Yeah. I can't wait for opposing players to come here and jack home runs. It just has a Not our own. Yeah, I think it just has a better ring than I can't wait for Tyler Soderstrom to come here and hit home runs. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry, who's who? That? who? I don't even I know who that is. Kind of anyway, we digress. Catcher, first baseman, <laughs> baseball. Nerd. He's the future in Oakland. Well, I just went through my roto drafts. You don't know. Oh God, you don't, don't know how deep these started. things are. What is it? Fifty rounds? Uh, well, it's an auction. It's twelve teams, twenty-three players each, plus six minor leaguers. It Holy is very. Shite. Uh, Carmen calls it "Revenge of the Nerds." Yeah. Like, oh, do you have your "Revenge of the Nerds" call today? I'm like, yeah, I do. I love how It'll I be just three said, or four hours this year. I'm like, could be five. Don't get you started, and then I got you started. That's why I'm not in one. Yeah. Uh, JT Miller with the honor fight for Elias Patterson. Did anybody's anybody else's heart go in their throat thinking Dakota Joshua and McKenzie and, and whistle and you don't need this smoke, JT? Well, also did not have that on the bingo card. Well, and also <laughs> b- big boy and didn't fare very well in that fight. Glad it was over early. Bit of a suicide pass by Garland right at the end. Well, yeah, it kind of was. Part of me was like, good, love the morale, stick up for your teammates. Another part of me was like, oh, man, no. a clean hit, a fight again, really? And have we not learned our yes. lesson here with honor fights? Yeah, not right now. We miss one of our best players for 18 yeah. games and, because of a broken hand and, in an honor you fight. Can, you can't even make the excuse like if it was against the Oilers. Oh, you're setting the stage for the for the playoff match. Mm-hmm. Like it's against the Coyotes. Give right. the guy a stiff arm, no, exactly, and skate away. Go over, but, mean mug him. You know, yeah. push him around a little bit. Yeah, flip but the visor George, up. But JT Miller hurt at this stage of the no. season. That's game For over. No Master. reason. Stop. That, that is game over, season over, playoff over. Against Josh Brown, it, <sighs> Mackenzie Entwistle. Does this does this put to bed the? Was it McBain? Was it, it, was, it was McBain? McBain. Does yeah. it put to bed the JT Miller and Elias Pettersson can't get along? No storyline. No, no, it doesn't. No, no, no. Does yes, that, you ma- know, does that matter? There's a teammate on it, doesn't code matter regardless exactly. of whether you it, like it, the guy or not. It, it, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, but I, I don't think they're friends, and I don't think they ever will be friends. But I don't think that how many friends did Michael here? Jordan have? Not very Bulls many, teams. if you've watched yeah. uh, the documentary. Yes. That's yes. my point. He, he thought he and BJ Armstrong were tight, but I don't think JT Miller saw it a little different. I don't think JT Miller's also got the <laughs> leash that, that Michael no, Jordan has. No, no. Fair. No, no, very fair. No, when you're goaty, when you've got six rings, then yeah, yeah. whatever you say goes. Right, and smart, and by especially me. in that sport too. There's only five, guys, you know, five guys on the court, all the twelve on the roster. Many don't play, so yeah, yeah. Mfic, <laughs> Michael Jordan, a little bit different. Smart of Miller not to draw the instigator there too. Mm-hmm. It was a tactical move, and we will get to that later in the program. What did we think of the Pew Suter scratch? Whoa. What did I say on For yesterday's a show? Defenseman. What did I say on yesterday's show? In the wake of the uh, of the game in Vegas. Did Pew Suter play last night? Right. But he had the highest expected goals, Blake. No, invisible. And uh, you know, doing the little things as a guy who's been given a lot of opportunity up the lineup. I mean, I, I said last night during the game on social, like 
great that Pod Colson looked good. I'm tired of seeing that he and Mikheyev look good. They just flat out need to get bottom line at this point. Like enough of looking good. Great that they're quote unquote tracking well. At this point, put a goal behind a goaltender for heaven's sakes. Like I, I, this, this is not the tri league. You know, get it done. Yes. So right back with them Saturday against the Kings or. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I would. You're not dressing a seven Mark Friedman again. No. And, and honestly, the opponent mattered. Honestly, I, I think that was just, uh, that was a shake it up, get an attention. No. Well, I think it was just shake it up for Suter, but that, that it was Friedman, I think was a, hey, good job practicing and being on. You know, well, it's under a, heat lamps, all these get, he's going to give them energy. And yeah. then, it's just a message to the rest of the team saying, yeah. look, guys, we need more out of you right now. Mm-hmm. I'm putting a depth seven, eight defenseman in yeah. as a forward because well, the rest of you can't produce and a pugnacious guy too. Yeah. Right. But like I just said, the opponent matters, right? Mm-hmm. They're not probably not doing that against mm-hmm. the LA Kings. Probably not doing, not doing that against the Edmonton Oilers. Right. Um, This from Elliot Friedman on Donnie and Dolly. I heard a rumor that Elias Lindholm might not play the rest of the regular season, but multiple people told me I shouldn't go with that. But you just did. Well, you did. <laughs> we were, um, to me, this is the trouble and the evolution of insiderism yeah. of saying things mm-hmm. on both sides of your mouth, yeah. saying things that are blatantly obvious. Mm-hmm. I, I won't get too far down this rabbit hole, but the – the breaking news that multiple platforms go with oh, on so and so is going to expect this amount of money. Well, yeah, they're, they're going to expect that. But like, what is that? That's don't, not a scoop. Don't don't get me started with breaking news because I did four years of J school where we defined what breaking news is. Yeah, and then you go out into the world, and this is even before social media, and some of the uh, what are they called again? Banners, uh, ch- uh, chirons. Yeah. Keys, on CNN breaking yeah. news. Yeah, like, no, it's not breaking news. But saying that a so and so breaking news is really quite narrow in comparison to what's tagged breaking news. Player wants X amount of money per year next year. That's I'm, not breaking. I'm news. sure they do, no. but no. Do, they want the well, most they money. Could, they, they come could. out and say, "I'm not signing with the Vancouver Canucks unless I get five million minimum per year." Yeah, well, that's news. Yeah, but I hear that they want to make the most amount of money they mm-hmm. can next year. That's yeah. not news. That's not an insider scoop. Anyways, let's Enough. get to the matter at hand. Yes. Uh, well, how much would we fret a Lindholm being dropped back in game one of the playoffs? Uh, I mean, I think I'm fine with that. I mean, if 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 there's if there's real benefit to him healing for that much more, then by all means. Again, he's not needed right now. The Canucks can go three and three without him. Um, so if, if they determine mm-hmm. he'll be that much better off by sitting until the first game of the playoffs, I don't think there's so much rust built up there that he's going to be dreadful. Are you dropping him back into the power play on night one? Uh, I mean, Pat, first, first, first unit, first course. unit, yeah. probably not unless he, unless if the Canucks don't play until the Monday of 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 that uh, of that starting weekend, we've lost Matt. Then, what do you mean? Your camera just shut off. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Solo okay. Blake. He finally gets his wish. His own show. So is the camera not proper properly? Wow. Well, let me since, come. That let problem? me come check okay, it. You out go here. troubleshoot that. I'll keep. You going. can still There's talk. Um, if if he's not ready until the Monday, mm-hmm. and they get a bunch of practices there. Mm-hmm. Where he is on power play one, and then there's an extenuating circumstance there, and and I think that I would be kind of comfortable with that, but I don't think it's it's necessary. I, th- I think he mm-hmm. can probably drop on to power play two and and contribute that way, and the Canucks can go with right. whatever unit is working. Let's get to uh, a couple of other items here. Did you see our old friend Travis Green in that Devils Rangers game? I would have liked nothing more than Travis Green and Peter Laviolette facing off. Give that indignant so and so. Uh, yeah. I and it's not like Travis is my bestie or anything, but you know, at the end of the day, I, you know, I like Travis. I don't like any part of Peter Laviolette. I I, I think people like Peter Laviolette are or 
they hold hockey back. I should have um, I should have looked this up. But did they you know employ the um, instigator rule for the Hartley v. Tortorella brawl? Because I don't know that all the players involved in that brawl last night assumed that they'd be tossed out of the game as secondary, you know, I don't even know what the word is past that. <laughs> the the tertiary fights there at, that, that all came up. Like, I don't think we've seen that as far as I can remember where all of them get tossed after the original fight. You remember that? Did, did the other fights in the you know the Kellen Lane and BX did, yeah. did they get tossed I believe that they, night too I believe they did get tossed we're trying to troubleshoot my camera here <laughs> but um I also uh I think he, uh like the um the uh good friday brawl with the Nordiques and the Canadians I believe Everybody got thrown out of that. Right, but that was, I, I think, just be, for behavior rather than for the technicality mm -hmm. of this is a secondary fight, ergo, you're mm -hmm. gone. Like, I don't know if, I, so, again, I don't know if those eight guys knew yeah. they were going to get tossed. So uh, le let me ask you this. How many more line brawl? like, I think the line brawl is a dying breed, right? Because look at what instigated that. Uh, an enforcer taking a cheap shot at a player, mm -hmm. a revenge match with the enforcer on the ice, and lined up to take the opening face off. You need a lot of sort of conditions to fall into place to get the line brawl. That's what makes them rare to begin with, because we used to see them in the playoffs a fair bit. Yeah. The frustration line brawl in the playoffs, which you don't see as much of. I mean, you see pushing and shoving, you see rough stuff, you see scrum. The repetitive games, the setup mm -hmm. for the next game. But we know the central figure there is Rempy, the enforcer. Mm -hmm. And look, maybe he can play the game. He's certainly a big dude and seems to move around okay. So maybe he actually carves out an NHL career by being something more than just a fighter. But, you know, that sort of profile of player is not very commonplace anymore in the NHL. I do wonder how many more line brawls you're going to see going forward because the other thing i think is going to happen is at some point you're going to get a change in leadership and the new commissioner is going to come in and want to distinguish himself from gary bettman and he's going to say we're the only sport that puts up with this shit and not no longer not on my watch unless it's bill daly please save us from bill daly can't have more of the same you fruits of the poisonous tree you think they're going to do what though to legislate it? well i i i, I We've seen in the queue, right? And how they've gotten tougher on fighting. I think you're coming to a point with the National Hockey League where five where fighting is going to be more than a five minute penalty. Where you're probably going to be thrown out of the game like in every other sport. Yeah. I again I don't know how how near we are to that, but I would I would think that when when we get fresh fresh leadership in the league, I think this will be something that they tackle. I mean, having a five in a game, I don't think it kills fighting entirely because I, th I think it moves. No, I think it moves no. fights to the third period <laughs> to some degree. Yeah. <laughs> Where yep. I still want to send the message, but, you know, we were going to lose this game anyway, mm -hmm. but I want to send the message and I'm pissed off at this guy. You're still going to see fights. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, that, that's the Q rule, is it not? Five in a game now for in the QMJHL? You get thrown out. Yeah. So, like you do with every other sport. Yeah. Right. Yeah, like, no, but you, no, you throw hands in any other sport. But you you're throw out hands. of that game, and you're probably out of more games too. That's what I was going to say. Is that I think in other sports mm -hmm. you get suspended. I don't. Right. I don't so think we're going to get to that. I, point. I think we're going to get to the point where hockey goes. Okay, we're at least going to throw them out of game. Yeah, might might be. Uh, Abbotsford wins again. They beat Manitoba five two. Atsu Ratu stays hot. He's another goal and assist. Max Sasson's points sadly in uh, EPD. Elias Pettersson, the defenseman, gets his first. Sasson almost got a point on a beautiful yeah, little pass there from Lekromaki. And it, some good things going on there with Abby. Yeah. Yep. And they've they clinched, clinched yesterday. Yeah, yeah, they clinched a playoff berth. We should have got to that on yesterday's show uh, when we were talking about some of the prospects and the goings on with the Abby Canucks. So DPD talking about on. how he's uh, sticking up for the Lecker when he got hit the other That's night. That's right. Lekromaki's still pointless. 
three games in now, still yeah, pointless. A bunch of shots. He's had chances. It's it's coming. Don't worry. It's coming. Well, he doesn't look uncomfortable out there, so that's that's the important thing. Uh, one thing we want to note here. We've been telling you about our event on April 20th at the Hollywood Theater on West Broadway in Kitsilano. Changing the time on that. We've been saying doors at 12. We're moving the doors back to 1. And the stage show is going to start around 2, media stage show. That is to give media panelists an opportunity to uh, cover a potential practice that morning at Rogers Arena. Slash morning skate. Still yeah. make, or yeah. morning skate still make it to the venue. A lot of you have said, hey, isn't that the first day of the playoffs? Like, won't that be up against the Canucks? No, it's an afternoon event. If the Canucks are forced to play on the 20th, we can't anticipate it would be anything other than a 7 p.m. start at Rogers Arena. I mean, they're be in less Winnipeg than, two time zones away on the evening yeah, of the 18th. That would be less than 48 hours to prepare right. for game one. It's not happening. Right. So uh going to move things back. We'll get you out of there in good time to make the game. If In fact, you need to uh, yeah. make your way to Rogers Arena. Tickets are $10 plus some taxes and fees. They work out to like $13. You can get them at nationgear.ca. As mentioned, the proceeds going to the BC Mental Health Foundation. The charity hand selected by Catherine Boxford, who's going to be in attendance. She'll be speaking. Bro, do your playoffs. Our friends from the matinee are going to play. And uh, yesterday we uh, sketched out a couple of media panels that will take your audience questions, talk about our city's return to the hockey playoffs. First time in nine years, of course, because the bubble playoffs mm-hmm. taking place in Edmonton. Bro, do your playoffs presented by Fountain Tire. Tickets nationgear.ca even basketball phil is coming blake Ooh. basketball phil doesn't do a lot of public appearances in fact last time i think we saw basketball phil was at a canadian's home opener i forget if it was last year or the year before but basketball phil said to me matt it's a catter day, catter I'm, coming, day. I'm coming out to see it do me a favor folks mm-hmm. if you're diehard fans of what we do if you kind of eh, those guys kind of piss me off come anyway Aids for charity. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'll take all your questions. Exactly. Ask us questions mm-hmm. live. If you never had questions, you know, read on the air, um, we, I, I, we'd be I, happy to take them. I'm one. hoping to plant a question in the audience. He'll, he'll measure your wingspan. Plant a question. Grady will be uh, operating the uh, wireless mic, taking audience questions. I, I, I plan to plant a question to a certain panelist. Oh. What's that? Tony well, G? No, no, not not Mr. Gallagher. Something about Vegas? No. 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 I'm just wondering if there's a free Don't table. Don't spoil. A free table. Oh. At a certain radio station in this city. All right. Whether anything has been Those two removed guys in the morning, yeah. Illicitly. Yeah. Oh. From the quote unquote free table. They're gonna be exhausted. It'll be, you know. Mid afternoon. That's oh, bedtime yeah. for yeah, them. Yeah, they'll need a nap. Yeah. The big Mid-day. one's going to need a nap. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, we're going to have a lot of fun on the 20th of April at the Hollywood Theater on West Broadway. And kids, please do join us, nationgear.ca, for your tickets. I want to shout out listener Adrian. Encountered him here on Hornby, just outside our, our studio earlier today. Rolled down the car, car window and goes, Hey, love the show. I go, Great. Appreciate you listening. Thanks for that. I go, you got a car flag there. He goes, yeah. yeah. That's the first car flag I've seen this year. He car goes, flag. Wow. Yeah. And he goes, if you want to take a picture and post it on social, that'd be cool. He goes, but just don't get my face. <laughs> was it a was it a maroon? Adrian, orca? I got a kind of a bad photo of the flag. I'm not sure we're going to post it, but thank you for listening. Was it a maroon orca or is it the current colors? Uh, I don't remember the car flags in the current colors. That's a good question, actually. I it pictured is, them in the no, Nazlin it's a blue, colors. It's a blue. It's a blue orca. But, but, but. but but like Naslin blue or this yeah. blue? No, more no more this blue. Green, yeah? green okay. trim. I don't remember that being part of what? this era. I guess it was in 2011. Yes. Yeah. I'm going and to my parents And in 2010 tonight. and 2000. Like the, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm finding my car flag tonight at my parents' house. Got the are orca. You really? I got the stick and rink. So these are leftover car flags from playoffs. Oh, yeah. here? oh wow. Okay, yeah. for, do us a favor, folks. If you see a lot current, of dust on them, like is, does does Connect Tire have um, have uh, current car flags available? Like, is that still a yeah, thing being sold? They're selling for like twenty five bucks or something. They are okay. Twenty five, something like that. Car- Don't quote me. Come on. Okay. Wait, you won't. That's, you that's won't a be better margin yours? than fountain soda. 
You won't be decking your car out in Canucks Lake? Well, we'll mm. see what she says. No. <laughs> oh, she wants to put she the makes car the flag. Decisions. Well, she's look, if there's a car flag that enters our home, it's absolutely going to be taken by her for her car. Michael on YouTube says he still has his car flag from old yeah. four. So he's rocking the uh oh so he's the, rocking the maroon. The maroon and, okay. Your car flag will say proud cat owner. Mm. <laughs> I have two cats. We're going for vaccinations this afternoon. I'm just uh oh. I'm just fearing what the bill's gonna be on that. Mm. You don't have kitty insurance. I told her you should get kitty insurance. Let's get kitty insurance. Apparently they've done the math on that, and on average it doesn't pay off. I got puppy insurance and it's already paying off. Mm. But we digress. Oh, yeah. We do well, digress. Let's finish yeah. this up yeah. here with today's menu brought to you by Greta. And we're going to be at Greta on the 18th for a watch party. Looking forward to that. 50 West Cordova. Great spot to catch the games throughout the season. Quick walk to the Rinker Stadium. Go to spot. Food, drinks, fun before, after the game. That awesome arcade. Make it a game night at Greta. 50 West Cordova or a Greta bar. Dot com. Frank Corrado is going to stop by. We'll talk to the former Vancouver Canuck and TSN hockey analyst. He'll give us his picks for the Pacific Division, for the Norris, for Team MVP, as well as talk about potential first-round matchup, who he would prefer if he was the Vancouver Canucks. We'll do some hashtags, the best and worst of Twitter. Hashtags today featuring, uh, this is on the podcast side, uh, some Canucks prospects, and then j is going to stop by as well after... Um, covering the Canucks' victory over Arizona with some news about Rinkwide. Rinkwide, also going live mm -hmm. starting Saturday. Post-game wars are back. Hey, you. No, not, not you. You. Are you, uh, you an owner-operator? You have a fleet of trucks or cars? Well, CalPro Plus might be the dedicated tire program just for you. Free program includes exclusive deals and savings, price match guarantee, flexible financing, and preferred pricing on everything you drive. Also, you get a dedicated member support line. That means that you can get questions answered. Also, they'll source and recommend the right tire for you, your application, and your budget. Cal Tires Network of 260 plus stores are here to help so you can focus on the road ahead. Sign up for free at calproplus.com. Joined now by former Vancouver Canuck TSN hockey analyst Frankie Corrado, who uh, I'm sure took in the Vancouver Canucks and their thrilling 2 1 victory over the Arizona Coyotes and noticed that the Dallas Stars thumped Edmonton. Yeah. 5 nothing. So a seven point gap. They've got two in hand, the Oilers do, and a head to head. But what do you think, Frankie? Is this done and dusted, or are the Vancouver Canucks going to win the Pacific Division? Yeah, I, I feel like they're they're going to win the division, and they deserve to. Like from from start to finish, so far this season, they've been the best team in that division. There's been a number of stories that have emerged here. Whether it's Rick Tockett getting the most out of the group, the star players really leading the charge, depth players like that. There was a point in time where the third line for the team was one of the best lines in the NHL. Uh, management deserves a ton of credit for the way they've been able to bolster the blue line. So you add all those things up and you have, you know, the Edmonton Oilers who really were spinning their wheels out of the gate. Vancouver took full advantage of that. And the division is theirs. The Pacific division belongs to the Vancouver Canucks. And that is, you know, it's a feather in the cap of a lot of people there. Um, it's, it's recognition for a lot of hard work um, executed very, very well and uh, very well deserved for everyone involved. And and that's great that they've been able to maintain this. And and again, it's not it's not math yet. It's not uh, done done, but it's looking very good. But does the how matter? How they are finishing this off at this point in the season? Um, they got the win last night. You get those two points. But man, uh, <laughs> not the easiest. narrow victory. Haven't beaten a playoff team in almost a month. Not like, exactly yeah. a uh, a Mona Lisa of finishing. Um, I mean, they dominated the game in a lot of ways, and yet they didn't look like they were overwhelming the Coyotes in a lot of ways as well. The how is going to matter, and you know you can talk about great stretches of hockey that the team has had. Go back to earlier in the season, it felt like they they couldn't lose, they couldn't miss, all that kind of stuff. It, it kind of gets thrown out the window come playoff time. It matters how you're playing right now going down the stretch here. And a good example of that would be the Florida Panthers from last year. Like they were playing really desperate, really hungry hockey for the last, I don't know, 
couple weeks to a month at least. They finally get into the playoffs in the last day of the regular season, and they go on this run. There was no load management. There was no talk about, you know, we're going to rest this guy. We're going to rest that guy. It was, we need to do everything we possibly can to get into the playoffs. And that really carried over into their game. Now, with that being said, I think, you know, we're, we're trying to look back and see what have we learned about the Canucks this season? There's a few things that really stick out. When the offense is cooking, they're a very dangerous team. One of the things that's been very constant with the team is that they can be very difficult to play against. They can be physical. So knowing that and seeing that for larger sample sizes this year, when the calendar flips and all of a sudden we're talking about the playoffs, you know that's there and you know that's available. Now it's just up to the group to channel that. And I would say that these last few games of the regular season, whatever we have left, is it six or seven? It's like it is a little bit of um, a weird time because you know where you're going. You don't necessarily know exactly who you're playing, but at some point here, you're going to have to find that that full intensity level. And given what we've seen from the team this season, I would be fairly confident that they can find it uh, when when the time really matters. And that's going to be, you know, April 20th or whenever the playoffs do open up. Yeah. It's a subconscious thing, right? Like the athletes can't flip the switch early. The coaches implore them, do it now. It's harder to do in game one. And yet they can't, they, they, they can't say, I'm going to bring playoff intensity tonight. Um, we know they do in game one, but yeah. Right. Like if it's, if it's not the playoffs, it's, it's not the playoffs. It's, it's hard. You're playing, <laughs> you're playing a back to back. Like they play a back to back. You can take Vegas. the reservation, but it's about keeping the reservation, right? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone can just take a reservation. Yeah. Like, okay. So they're playing a back to back. They play in Vegas. Doesn't go their way. It's not a very good game. That's fine. But at least you go into Arizona, a team that, you know, they they lost a million games in a row earlier in the season, it felt like, but they give you a good game. Like they're, you know, they're they're not an easy out. So in that situation, they play, you know, they play a solid game. Quinn Hughes really led the charge last night. Seelov was really good. But there's that bounce back. There's that bounce back performance that you're kind of looking for in that situation. And so there's another, you know, check box where it's like those situations are going to arise where you don't have a good night in the playoffs. How do you bounce back? you know, the day after tomorrow. And, you know, that's just a little bit of a, a glimpse maybe to how the team can can bounce back, even though Arizona is a, an inferior an opponent that's not going to make the playoffs. And, you know, like you guys pointed out, it's been wins have been easy to come by against those kinds of teams, not as easy to come by against really good teams. But the same can be said for the Edmonton Oilers right now. It seems like when they play a, a an inferior opponent, it's point night. They look great defensively. Goaltender looks good. Depth scoring is there. What happened when they played the Dallas Stars last night? It was, you know, shades of a lot of the other issues that have plagued that team in the past. So I would say it's not just the Vancouver Canucks that have had that pop up into their uh, narrative in, in, at this point in the season. If you were the Canucks, Frankie, who would you want in the first round? Vegas, LA, or Nashville? Yeah, this is... This is the question everyone seems to be asking, and who's got? And let me just, you know, like I'm not the who do you want? We want so and so, you know, like the cocky yeah. fan base. Who do you want? Who would you prefer in terms of a matchup stylistically for the Canucks? I probably want the Nashville Predators, and that's no slight to Nashville. What that is is more of the style of game that Nashville is going to play. They forecheck hard. They play an up-tempo kind of game, but that means it's going to be an up-tempo type of game both ways. And I think when you play against LA, you can really see how they slow things down to their pace. They really get you in the mud, in the neutral zone. And it seems like it's hard for Vancouver's, their, their star players at least, to get a little bit of space, to generate anything off the rush, to turn rush chances into cycle chances, into offensive zone play. So with all that being said, I know there's going to be a, a goaltender X factor there, but like the style of game that Nashville plays where it's going to, it's going to have a lot of pace. It's going to be giddy up and go kind of hockey. I think that's better for the Vancouver Canucks than this, you know, slow kind of slog kind of game uh, that the LA Kings seem to try and get teams so to play in. Yeah. Canucks are three and zero against Nashville this year, uh, five, two, three, two, and five, two. Of course they haven't played since December 
19th. And Nashville found themselves. Well, you know. you know, that was before that Nashville went on punishment, missed the U2 concert, and decided we were going to be the best team. You have to there. think if it For wasn't U2, like if it was a different band, would we have a different result? Like I'm trying to think if there's, hmm. you know, what, what other bands out there that have that kind of magnitude that, right. you know. I don't know. Yeah, because that was quite a punishment, right? Like the, you were just taking away a concert you were, you know, excited for. Like this, yeah, but as you it said, a generational like, concert here. You two at the right. sphere. Yeah, no offense. It's not Billy Currington at Bridgestone Arena. Like you could see Billy any night on Broadway. Mm-hmm. It's, it's right. you two at the sphere, man. I don't know. How about Dead and Company? Dead and Company is going to play the sphere. Or, uh, you know, they're. Ooh. Dead and Company. They, I think it's the lone remnant of of the Grateful Dead, surrounded oh, by like John it? Mayer and oh, and a bunch uh, of. Are other you guys. a Deadhead? Is that no, what I'm not. But it? I'm I'm uh, uh, one degree away from a lot of Deadheads, so I'm <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm up to speed on Dead and Company. Okay. Does that mean you do acid with Deadheads? <laughs> <laughs> no, it means I that, know Deadheads that do acid. See, that's oh. that one step away. Once he does acid with them, then he's fully in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, more of a microdoser. Right. We'll uh, connect you with Bill Walton next time we're down yeah. in California. <laughs> um, okay, so you want Nashville? Uh, answer me the poll. Who's the club MVP here? JT Miller, Quinn Hughes. Feel free to go off the board. It's Quinn Hughes. It's Quinn Hughes for me. I I, I really do believe he's going to win the Norris Trophy this season. Although you can make a very compelling case for Roman Yossi now that Nashville has really come on strong in the the latter parts of the season. You'll always be able to make a strong case for Kale McCarr. But Quinn Hughes is the best defenseman in the NHL this year. He's meant the most to his team um, outside of probably Roman Yossi. Like that's where the argument for Yossi really comes into play. Um, And the way he's kind of elevated his game and took his game to another level, it's, it's very impressive. JT Miller has done that as well, though. Like JT Miller has come back this season and really relished the role that he's been playing. I thought it was incredible that JT Miller... Uh, goes and drops the gloves two nights ago, right after Pedersen gets hit. It's like, I don't know, it, it, I, that, it screams leadership to me. And the way he did that without taking the instigator was perfect. Like, that's how you do it. You go up to the guy, you challenge him, you shake your gloves, you kind of force him to call your bluff, let's say, um, and get him involved in that altercation. I thought that was really well done. There's probably not a wrong answer to this, but my answer is going to be Quinn Hughes. The, the, just the, the amount of ways he affects the game and the way he always seems to have the puck on his stick, just so much needs to go through him for this team to be successful. And if you were to take Quinn Hughes out of the lineup, I think this team's game would look very different. I think it would look more different if you took Hughes out of the lineup than if you took Miller out of the lineup. But I think that's I think that speaks more to Hughes's brilliance this year. How yeah. many how many votes does he get for the heart, do you think, Quinn Hughes? Mm. Ooh, first place votes, I don't think he gets any first place votes. No. I just think it's it's too it's too crowded. Like it it's it's gonna be a legit probably four person race. If Matthews touches 70, like he's gonna get first place votes, whether people in Vancouver want to hear that or not. And, and defensemen are have been left off the ballot here. Like they don't get the heart votes yeah. anymore. They just don't. Well, yeah, yeah. you've got three players at 126 points or greater and counting here. Mm-hmm. So this has been a, a pretty extraordinary. 90 point season. defensemen are pretty rare too, though. No, no, yeah. totally yeah. get it. And and we hey, we had this discussion the last couple of years with Roman Yossi and Eric Carlson. Um, but Kucherov, McKinnon and McDavid and how they've carried their team. And then as Frank says, with uh, Matthews potentially going for 70 goals, that's, uh, I think he's going to get fourth and fifth place votes. I just, I agree with oh, Frank. Yeah. I don't think he's going to get, uh, I don't think he's going to get any first place. votes. I forget if we asked you about this last week. I don't think we did, but he's now playing the game at a level, Frank, where he had a comment after a game last week that, he has to be very calculated in terms of when he decides to take the puck and rush up ice or when he decides to pinch off the point and try and create something offensively in the half court because he's got to be able to conserve energy. And he was talking about how he'll, you know, he needs to read situations where teammates have gotten inside. Like the hockey IQ here is now on a, a different level. He's playing 
chess while everybody else is playing checkers. Yeah, it's interesting that he talks about that because when you watch him play, you would just think it's go time every time because it's it seemingly is, right? Every time in the offensive zone, he'll get involved. He'll activate off the blue line in the neutral zone. He'll throw a fake one-way spin off you the other way, and then he's carrying the puck up. But it's interesting to hear him you know, have those comments because in order to do that, at the quality rate at which he does it, the quantity rate probably needs to drop a little bit. Like if you're going to try and do that every time you have the puck on your stick, you're going to fizzle out within the game and then from game to game. I so think that is, about him all the time. I think, right? uh, how do you have the energy to keep doing this? Yeah, quality quality touches over quantity of touches really really makes a difference. And mm-hmm. I don't know. You, you look back at some of the look back at some of the best defensemen that have ever played the game. I'll think of one who who plays different than Quinn Hughes, obviously. Nick Lidstrom. Nick Lidstrom did the simplest things incredibly well. Like just just so simple, but so well. And then every once in a while, there was that flash of brilliance. And you're like, whoa, that really kind of, that caught your eye, let's say. And I think that's that's the same for Quinn Hughes in a different style because he's a little more loud on the ice. Obviously, the skating is a, a little more uh, bold and creative, all that kind of stuff. But watch him play. It's like, there's a few simple plays that he makes and you're like, okay, that's just, you know, that's to, to use the, the baseball term. I think Botchford like using it, it was like, that's a single, that's another single. All of a sudden there's your home run play. And, you know, we've seen that home run play quite a bit here from him. Um, and last night included in that and even um, against Vegas the other night. Adding a skill though, too, while you're a pro, like seeing last year, I want to be a better shooter and becoming a better shooter and scoring goal. Like, uh, that's not easy to do either. We we talked about Bo Horvat improving his skating forever and ever, and it's just um, adding adding skill while you're a pro after you've turned. I mean, that's it's hard to do as you can imagine. There's there's honestly two things there. Like you can work with someone like these shot doctor guys that really just sh- work on shooting. There's a few of these guys around the league that guys go and see. The other thing is the sticks now are so responsive to you. So if you're a guy who was, you know, maybe not the strongest guy, didn't maybe lean on your stick as much and you were using an 80 flex stick, all of a sudden your coach comes to you and says, we want you to shoot the puck a little bit more. We want you to hit the one timer a little bit more. You go to Bauer or CCM or whoever your stick manufacturer is and you say, I I need uh, a little less whip on this stick. I need a little bit of a different kick point because I'm going to try this shot a little more this season because coaching staff has identified, hey, you can hit this one timer way more than you actually do, but you don't feel comfortable doing it. So you give your, you know, your tool mm-hmm. a better opportunity to actually hit that shot. And I don't know if that's that's happened, but that's one of those things where it's like that's part of the equation as well. Um, so it is working on your craft. It's also giving yourself a better opportunity with the stick that you have. Uh, last question here. Ever involved in a line brawl? Oh, buddy. You know what? I I would have been if my gloves weren't sewn on. I think that was part of the deal. Um, when I got to each team, I asked the trainer, can you just sew them on for me so they don't come off? Um, I... <laughs> I was, you know, I was, I was involved in a weird little altercation uh, in Utica once uh, playing in the minors. We were playing in Binghamton and it was a pretty simple play. Like I just kind of boxed out a guy, you know, simple cross check. And he like he really got pissed off at me. And so now he's going back and forth. He's like, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, you know, mess you up, whatever. Like there's some, you know, some, some threats going my way. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, well, okay, I'm, I'm going to be a little shit disturber. And I guess I'll tell him he's going to the East Coast Hockey League next year. And that didn't go over very well. <laughs> um, and he says, I'm going to jump you. I'm like, okay, just do it. <laughs> you know, like, what are you going to do? You're going to jump me. So he, he ended up jumping me. And, you know, all kinds of guys jumped in after it was, um, you know, it was, I don't know. I think that's the closest thing I ever came to a line brawl in pro hockey. No uh, pro fights? So? Do, do you have pro fights? Uh, I have pro jumpings. Uh, <laughs> that's that's one of them. Uh, the other one was also in Utica. My D partner, I think it was Johnny Negrin, good Vancouver guy. He got hit yeah. from behind, and it was one of the Be- Cody Beach, maybe one of the, like maybe I don't know. I someone's whose last name was Beach. Yeah, and Chris? I yeah. maybe yeah, okay, yeah, maybe Chris. And I went up to him. I was twenty. I just like I'm gonna cross check him. And his gloves were off before I could even get the cross check on his body. And next thing you know, I'm like, oh, man, 
I should have been more prepared for that. So I showed up to that fight late as well. Um, yeah, <laughs> you never want to be late. To so fight. I was late. I was late to a lot of fights. In my late life. to a lot of fights. Uh, well, and the other thing is, who could want to fight you? Uh, is that the honor code you have to tell the guy before you're going to jump him? You know that is quite noble. Is I'm, that, I'm going yes. to yeah. jump you. At least, at least I had notice, right? And the sucker yeah, punch some... is less suckery when you're yeah. saying I'm going to sucker punch you. <laughs> I actually think I think I actually think Markstrom, like Markstrom, was playing that game, and he like he he loves an altercation like that. Oh so yeah, sure he oh, came, we flying, know. He oh, came yeah. flying down the ice, and he had the blocker going. Um, hey man, you know what? It's a Wednesday night in Binghamton, New York. Anything goes, right? right. right. And, and as we, you know, Jake's got a little bit of that wild man streak to him. You know? Oh yeah, yeah. You know, in if, fiery if, you bait, if you bait it enough, you're gonna see, you're gonna see it, and he will throw yeah. hands. If we had one, to. we had one in junior. Actually, we had a line brawl in junior. It was it was game four of our playoff series against the Barry Colts. And how's this for a left side of the ice? Okay, let's see if you guys can are familiar with any of these names, which you will be for sure. They were an older team. They were going for the championship. They ended up losing to Windsor in the finals that year. Their left wingers were. Darren Archibald, Stefan Della Rovere, Kyle Clifford, and Zach Ronaldo. And I was 16 years old. Oh my and God. those animals Pugnacious. were yeah. around the ice. Yeah. Yeah. And, well, and, uh, and we had a line in the call NHL with them. The yes. Yeah. Clifford was in the NHL an, the next as a 19 year old. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we had a line brawl with them. And I remember my D partner who was also 16 years old, but he was built like he was from Thunder Bay, you know, six, four, 225. He went Kyle Clifford. And uh, that was yeah, that was that was wild. What, I was not what, what happens in a line brawl Wise. if everybody starts to pair off and you're the pacifist at the uh, at the end there who really doesn't want to fight? Like, are you allowed to abstain? Like, four guys have paired off. What if you're the last guy and you're like you're looking at the one guy that's there? Do you, do you just say I don't? I, I'm not interested. Like, is that possible, well, or do you pay for it for the rest of your career? I think I think what has to happen here is is a little something called cutting a deal. And this is this is, you, you know, grab each other's jerseys and watch. It's a little bit of. Yeah, it's a little bit of, you know, it's theatrical. Right. right we're not the dancing. main event. We're like yeah. the under 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 card. And it's like, mm -hmm. hey, we're just going to grab each other. You know, nothing like we know what this is all about. We're just you know, we just got to do it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it, it's you know, you cut a little deal. There's a mutual understanding. You have to hope, though. That the other person, Blake, is in the same situation. Right, he you. might want to go. Mm -hmm. He might want to. Oh, you could look across there, and it's some guy who's got the look on his face of a pit bull, and he's going to eat your face off. You're like, <laughs> oh man, get the get the stretcher, get the get the dark oh, room ready. So good, so yeah. good. Yeah. Thank you, Frank. Uh, we are a lot richer with knowledge in terms of the code, <laughs> the etiquettes, and the mechanics. Uh, yes, of the line brawl. Appreciate it, Yeah. See you. Thanks. Hey, everybody, if you're enjoying what you're seeing here, then follow along with Secure Some Price on YouTube. I promise more content coming. They call it, the kids call it subscribe on YouTube. Well, how about liking it? Do that as well. Smash it right now. In a season like this, you never want to miss a single second of what's happening on the ice. And you want to be around your fellow fans, right? Well, Greta Bar YVR at 50 West Cordova, the perfect spot to do so. Hey, if you've got tickets, a great place to pre and post. They've got drink specials every single day. And if you don't have tickets, well, stick around and soak up the atmosphere with all your fellow fans, play all the great video games and air hockey, great air hockey set up as well at Greta Bar YVR. We'll see you there, 50 West Cordova. Bro. Bro, 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 you ready to do these playoffs? Bro, do your playoffs. Come join us April 20th at the Hollywood Theater, West Broadway in Kitsilano. Doors at noon, a special playoff media event. We'll look forward to the playoffs. We'll have some media panels on stage. We're going to raise some money in the name of our late friend and colleague, Jason Botford, for the BC Mental Health Foundation. Guests from across all sporting aisles, uh, a special musical set from our good friends at the matinee. Great food, good brews. It'll be a lot of fun. Tickets are just $10. So you can get them at nationgear.ca. Bro, do your playoffs. Jeff Patterson of Rinkwide Vancouver is our Canucks reporter. He joins after a 2-1 victory over the Arizona Coyotes. Um, Jeff is all well. 
with the Canucks <laughs> after a narrow win against a team like that? Let's forget about everything else. Mm-hmm. Nah, I felt an awful lot like the Anaheim game on Sunday. A win's a win, and those two points mean as much as the 10-1 romp over San Jose early in the season. But we're getting down to crunch time here, and every game is an opportunity for this team to sort of shake out of its offensive funk, and that hasn't happened. And so all these narrow wins against non-playoff teams, again, you take the two points and you move on and you hope your next game is better. But no, I mean, there are still concerns here. There's six games to go. You heard the coach imploring a handful of his players to start to dig in and play like it's the playoffs now, uh, because Rick Tockett knows he can't flip a switch. So... Uh, tougher tests ahead, starting on Saturday in Los Angeles, and then the return game with Vegas here at home next Monday night. And, of course, the game going into Edmonton. And we'll see what that means. I mean, what a night on the out-of-town scoreboard for the Vancouver Canucks uh, with Dallas doing a number on the Oilers. So it was a good night for the Vancouver Canucks. Some great individual performances. But collectively, yeah, there's still some red flags around this hockey club. Well, let me ask this, because we spent an awful lot of time uh, talking power play here of late, maybe since the All-Star break and what isn't working. Three straight games with the power play goal. Are we feeling better? Do we see the seeds or the beginnings of a fix here for well, the power play? I'll say that the sliver of light there is the way the goals have been scored. Brock Besser against Anaheim was sort of that Brock Besser power play goal on the doorstep in the blue paint, bangs in a, a loose puck. That was good. They got a puck through to the net, and then Besser was able to make something happen. In Vegas, Elias Pettersson's the guy standing right on the edge of the blue paint, a terrific screen. You know, it's not about the strength of the shot. It's about, does that shot get through the layers of defense? And they got one through in Vegas. And then last night, you know, Connor Garland, not the biggest guy in the world, obviously, but willing to go to the the tough area, stand his ground there. And Quinn Hughes just kind of flings that puck. So I I like the fact that pucks are being funneled to the front of the net. That's something that was lacking way too much perimeter play. And again, I think it underscores, doesn't have to be the big one-time blast. It doesn't have to be Elias Pettersson with the elite one-timer, although I Kind of like to see that come back from, from time to time as, as a weapon. But I do like the fact that the Canucks seem to be taking the message to heart of get some pucks to the net and then uh, some good things can happen. And yet one power play in which they don't get into the zone at all. <laughs> not, not at all. So, it, it, you know, like when I, I want to see a game, I would rather a game at this point where they go over three, but they are zipping the puck around and pelting the goalie and don't even score rather than getting a goal. And the other two or three times they can't even enter the zone yet because then the goal just seems lucky at that point. Yeah. And I mean, you and I were going back and forth uh, on social. Uh, that first one was dreadful. Like it, one shot on goal. And I think it came late in the, the first power play. And you're right. You can't get pucks to the net if you can't gain the zone and, and set up and, uh, look, they're going to face better opponents than the Arizona Coyotes uh, once the playoffs arrive. Like the Los Angeles Kings are the best penalty killing team in the National Hockey League, or at least they go back and forth with Carolina uh, on any given day. And if that's a first round opponent, like not only do you need your power play going, but then the matchup is, oh, you've drawn one of the top penalty killers in the National Hockey League. And that just tells you, you know, like, that's your first round opponent. So it's not just a one-off. That's going to be the entire series. And they're going to have to find a way to break down a penalty kill like the Los Angeles Kings if they run into them. And certainly they're going to get a taste of it on Saturday night. So you're right. There are still uh, lots of areas for improvement. They're still trying to figure out who's going to be the, the fifth guy on that power play with the, the big four. You know what's interesting, though, guys? is uh, And Quinn Hughes has scored a couple of power play goals here, doubled his season total in the last couple of games. I was looking at this just to see where his point production stood with the man advantage. And I I sort of forgot how good he was and that power play was early in the season. Quinn had 15 power play points in the first 22 games of the season. Wow. He has 19 in the 54 games since then. And since the All-Star break, only 11 power play points in 27 games. So a lot of numbers there, but you can see that, you know, his production at, at five on four has been in decline and I think it goes hand in hand with the struggles of the power play but you know it's not like he's going to get to 90 points absolutely feasting with the man advantage in fact his lead atop the NHL scoring among all defenders is bigger at even strength uh, than it is overall like he's got a five point lead on Kale McCarr but it's six over Josh Morrissey in terms of even strength points on the season so uh, it hasn't just been about Quinn Hughes and this incredible power play racking up the points uh, he's been doing a lot of his damage, obviously, over the, the bulk of the season at even strength. Mike. I think he's figured out to move. Like, he was moving on the power play. He was the instigator to move on the power play. And that's ultimately where those chances and the goals came from. 
Speaking of Hughes, um, you think he's going to win the Norse? <laughs> I think that's wrapped up now. I think these last two nights, like, even in Vegas, like the team is a disaster. And yet I think he, he was, was on great. the ice. He was on the ice for the first goal against, but after that, you know, it wasn't on his watch necessarily. And he scores two and he's trying to help his team claw its way back. And then last night, uh, a masterclass, uh, certainly the, the shift that led to the Connor Garland goal. Uh, the Coyotes just couldn't touch him. Uh, I mean, it, I've watched it a few times uh, since I saw it in real time. And it, it's a spectacular shift in a season that has been full of them. And, you know, that's at the tail end of back-to-back nights where he's logging big minutes and the motor is still going and the Coyotes, uh, they were chasing. And ultimately, Quinn Hughes, uh, you know, the shot goes wide. And, man, there were a lot of bounces off the end boards at the mullet. But uh, that bounce worked out well uh, with Connor Garland swooping in there and scoring against his former team to put the dagger in. So, yeah, I mean, they pull one out much as they did against Anaheim on Sunday where they needed a late goal. They get it. Uh, but again, I, I think that uh, they recognize that these types of efforts and look, territorially, they dominated, like they dominated everywhere, but on the scoreboard against Arizona. But that kind of brings us back to this idea that, you know, the Coyotes should never have been hanging around in that hockey game uh, in that second period that was so one-sided. The Canucks had to find a way uh, to, to stretch their lead. Uh, so we'll take that as a yes on the Norris. Does that make him the team MVP? Uh, he's been my MVP all season long, as great a season as JT Miller has had. I just think the the special things that Quinn Hughes has done from the outset, leveled up, taken on the responsibility of being captain, and taken his game to another level. And, you know, in the process, just continues to rewrite the Canucks record book, now into solo second all-time, only Alex Edler ahead of him. And Quinn Hughes is one more big season away from being the top dog all-time uh, among Canuck defenders. And he's going to get there at the age of 25, which is staggering in some ways. Because you're thinking about it. If he can be a career Canuck, he could have a full decade of seasons beyond. Like, pass Edler and still have 10 really good productive years. Like, in my world now, I'm starting to think there is a way someday, years down the road, we're going to look at Canucks defenseman scoring uh, in the history books. And Quinn Hughes will be at like 1,000 points. And second place will be 409 of Alex Edler. Like, I can see something like that happening. Like, yeah. you know, it's just the, the the rate at which he is scoring, the consistency. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think he's been the MVP just the way he tilts the ice almost every night out. There have been so few bad nights and even bad shifts for Quinn Hughes. Uh, I just think start to finish, he has been the most valuable player for this hockey club. saw your tweet um, the with the quote on the postgame report, uh, him saying it's serious hockey. I mean, <laughs> I love it. I mean, the, yeah. I, 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 we were kind of lamenting this yesterday. Like, can somebody please just look like, this is an, a different part of the schedule. Like it just doesn't seem like anybody knows where they are in the schedule outside of Quinn Hughes. Yeah. And that came after the comments of Rick talk at post game in Vegas. And then, you know, that's some message sending. I, I just don't see any other way when you're scratching Pia Suter, who, you know, is in a rut, but still does other things to help this hockey club. Guy's been on the first unit power play. I know that hasn't been a successful experiment, but I, I do think when they line up, Pia Suter is, certainly one of their nine or 10 best forwards. And so to pull him out of the lineup entirely, I felt like it was message sending. And you're right. The message doesn't like the urgency with which so many of these guys, Connor Garland's been playing with the urgency for a while. Quinn Hughes, uh, Dakota Joshua has been pretty good coming back and JT, the motor's always running, but you know, I think the list kind of stops around there and you know, so much focus on Elias Pedersen. I get that, but the same goes for Brock Besser and Suter when he's in the lineup, and there are others. And you see a second period like that last night, guys, where Mikheyev has the partial breakaway, no finish. Teddy Bluger at the side of the net set up by Mikheyev, no finish whatsoever. Pod Colson, you know, bull rush to the front of the net. That's great. Should have been a penalty on the play, but still no finish there. And you're just wondering at some point, like, and I know it's just like one goal. Like, does one goal get Pia Suter out of his slump uh, when he gets back in the lineup? No, it doesn't. But you want some of these guys to be feeling a little bit better about their game this close to playoff time. So, again, I go back to the second period. That game shouldn't have been close. And unfortunately, the Canucks right now seem to have this knack of letting teams hang around. But in the end, more often than not, uh, they're able to, to pull out the victory. What did you make of Archer's she loss? Yeah, how can you not be impressed? Like back to back, were you know low scoring game. The margins were fine. I mean, for the first half of the game, it's scoreless and a an Arizona goal, and who knows where that game goes from there. So 
you know, the only goal he gives up, uh, bang, bang play, the power play. You know, we saw a goal like that from Jamie Benn last week uh, in Vancouver. Uh, it turned out to be the game winner when the Stars were in town. This one tied the game. But, you know, something for the Canucks in front of their goaltenders to be mindful of is, you know, can they tighten up a little bit on the penalty kill? But uh, Arthur Silas had to make some saves. Certainly in the first 40 minutes, uh, you know, I think it's the mental challenge of staying in the game. But that pad save that he makes off Kessel Ring late in the second where he has to come uh, quite a distance from his right to his left. That was a spectacular save that preserves the one nothing lead. And then early in the third period, we started to see the Coyotes use some speed, drive wide, cut hard to the net a couple of times. You know, those pucks can find their way in. Clayton Keller tried to surprise him from a pretty sharp angle on the power play when he tried to slip it under Arthur Silovs. And I think he got close to the goal line, but uh, Silovs was able to make the save there. So, you know, he looks confident in the net. Uh, he's 2-0. and I know he hasn't faced the best teams in the National Hockey League, and it'll be interesting to see if there is another start for him here. But I thought pretty high praise from Rick Tockett after the game when he talked about he looks like Thatcher Demko in there just in terms of his calm demeanor and his composure for a guy that has only seen NHL shooters twice now all season long. He hasn't had a save percentage below 907 in over three years at any level. Um, he's 5-2 and two now career in the NHL with a 913 save percentage, and he's 23 years of age. Um, I mean, that's development. Like that's, well, that's a kid that's developing. So to me, the big question is, is he now the backup next year? Like, uh, do you feel good about moving on from Casey DeSmith and not having to pay that position? And, and and you're going to go forward with Arthur Silas as your backup goalie. Thoughts, Jeff? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, at this time last year, we thought that he was in consideration. And then obviously, and Patrick Alvin said he would be comfortable if that was the case. And then obviously, they went out and they got the, the made the DeSmith trade at the start of the season. I, I think for a team, and I know the cap's going up, but so are the salaries for Pedersen and Hironik and Dakota Joshua. You know, every penny is going to matter for the Vancouver Canucks. And if there is a way that they can save a little bit with a guy that uh, is going to be under contract at a team-friendly price, he always needs a new deal, but he's got no leverage. So, you know, it's still going to be a, a relatively low, maybe give him a couple of years of security and, and keep the dollars down. Whatever the case, yeah. And I think also there has to be some learnings on the part of the organization here that Thatcher Demko simply cannot push 60 games in a season. And so... You know, part of me would say, hey, at 23, do you want a young guy sitting on the bench not playing very much? But I think that we will see moving forward here that Demko's start rate will diminish, and that should mean uh, more starts for whoever the backup is. But if that's still off, you know, maybe you're looking at more of a 50-32 kind of split to keep that Demko as fresh and ready as possible for the playoffs so that he can get through a National Hockey League regular season, which is something that he hasn't been able to do as an NHL starter. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's there for, for Silov. So we'll see where it goes for the organization. But absolutely, I can see a path where he has graduated from the American Hockey League after this season to be a full-time National Hockey League. Demko played 64 games a couple of years ago, but do we have to call him injury-riddled? Is he an injury-riddled goalie? Is, is that Demko's label right now, given his history? I mean, I think it, it has to be noted that he has not been able to get through an NHL season without injury. And this is three years now that there's been a a significant knock to him that's kept him out of action for a while. And of course, the one two years ago after the heavy workload, they shut him down at the end of the season. Last year was gone for the middle three months. And here, you know, it's going to turn into uh, at least a full month for Thatcher Demko. It's promising that he's back on the ice and we'll see. It's an off day for the Canucks today and they'll have a practice, see how involved. You know, it's one thing to come out at the end of a morning skate in Vegas and just take pucks from Ian Clark, you know, can he ramp it up? Will he be a participant in practice? Uh, you know, there was a suggestion, I think uh, Earth made the suggestion on your show yesterday that, you know, maybe Monday against Vegas, that still seems premature to me. I wonder about the Arizona game next week, uh, just as a low event game, maybe to sort of ease a, a starting mm -hmm. goal center back in, especially if you hope to have him for the Edmonton game at the end of that week. So who knows, uh, moving targets there, but I'm curious to see, uh, how involved Thatcher Demko is going to be at the Friday practice at the Kings facility in El Segundo, and maybe we'll get a better read then on his readiness and uh, oh, you know go from there. But yeah, I mean, I, I I think it's not an unfair label at this point. Now, goaltenders, so many moving parts. You know, we still don't know ultimately what caused this latest injury for for Thatcher Demko. Uh, but I, yeah, I mean, at some point for him to sort of shed that label, he's going to have to be available to the Vancouver Canucks. You know all season long. And that's just something that hasn't been there in his game uh, in each of the last three seasons. Uh, did we talk Ian Cole with you a couple uh, earlier in the week? I'm not sure we did. 
no, because I haven't been on with you since right, the Vegas since game. Two, right. So, number one, I think Blake and I were both really surprised yeah, to well, see him back in the lineup on the second of a back-to-back after that game and at his age. And he winds up playing more minutes than Tyler Myers and Carson Soucy as well. Uh, we were just sort of musing, Jeff, like, is Noah Jolson a better option for them on the third pair right side as a natural righty with well and i was disappointed that nobody put the question to rick talking about like why mark friedman over noah Juleson. somebody did ask about going with 11 forwards and seven defensemen and talk said hey you like the energy that friedman brought uh both on the ice and on the bench um and i don't know if this was just throwing you know a, a loyal uh guy that has practiced a lot but hasn't played much throwing him a bit of a bone but i was surprised like if you're gonna go with 7 d why wouldn't Noah Juleson be that seventh defenseman? So that one was curious to me, and I'm with you. Like, lump me in that, you know, when we started to see some surprises uh, with the lineup at, at Mullet, one of them was Ian Cole is back in this lineup after being on the ice for the first five Vegas goals against, and, you know, not to pin the one Arizona goal on Ian Cole, but guess what? He was out there for that one as well. So it has not been a, you know, they only gave up one, and, and he was on the ice uh, for the power play goal again. So it's been a tough road trip for him. He's 35 now, and I get the history of Rick Tockett and Ian Cole from their time together in Pittsburgh and championships and those types of things, and that carries some significance, don't get me wrong, but this felt like, I mean, the coaches talked about the idea of load management. This felt like an example to put it in place, especially after a tough night for a veteran guy 24 hours earlier. So, yeah, I didn't get the decision there, and let's be honest, Ian Cole's play has declined over the course of the season. Like He was really good early. And it's a tough league. It gets younger every day. He's 35 now. And I do think that uh, the speed of the game, his age, all of that plays in. Uh, there's still a role for Ian Cole in this hockey club. But, you know, I asked the question on social as they lined up in Vegas, was that their best six? And is that the way that uh, you figure the Canucks would roll out their defense for game one of the playoffs, whoever they're playing against? And most people said, yes, it is. Uh I don't know. I mean, as the penalty kill starts to take on a little bit of water here as well, like that's an area that Noah Juleson has been able to contribute all season long. And I do wonder if there's at least something to think about there. So I'm really curious to see how many of the final six games does Juleson get into? Do they sit cold down at any point here? Obviously, that'll be dependent on how healthy uh, the other guys are around him. But uh, yeah, I was uh, more than surprised to see Cole in the lineup against Arizona. No, uh, I think that's an interesting one as we count down the games here and get set for the Stanley Cup playoffs. Lastly, Jeff, Mm -hmm. I understand we have some news about Rinkwide coming up on Saturday. Tell Well, we rolled that out uh, on the show last night. That's the final uh, Rinkwide in the old era of podcasts, strictly audio podcast only. Uh, We're getting with the times. I mean, look what you guys have been doing here uh, for a while now. Uh, This is the way the business is going, obviously. So we're adding a a video component. We're going to stream it live starting on Saturday night, Saturday Night Live. Uh, And then uh, from that point forward over the remaining regular season games and ramping this up, obviously, for the playoffs. So people have been asking about this for a while. You know, when can we listen? How can we listen? How can we see? All those types of things. The time has come, and especially with the Canucks returning to the Stanley Cup playoffs, uh, yes, it just felt like this was the time. So, you know, we got a, a couple of games here ahead of game number one to iron out whatever kinks we have to iron out. But uh, Farhan's going to be with me on Saturday, Brilliant. and we will go live uh, a couple of minutes after the final buzzer and do what we do. And the show will still be put out as a podcast as yours is as well. So if people have their habits and routines, fear not. Uh, we are just branching out into the video world here and uh, hoping that uh, we can open a few more doors and a few more eyeballs uh, as people get excited about the, the immediacy. The playoffs. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. And handsome Farhan for the first go round <laughs> on video. Uh, RWV SNL. Very much uh, yeah. look forward to that. Uh, Jeff, thank you for this. We'll be listening and watching on Saturday, buddy. Gotta I will catch comb up. my hair now. Yeah. <laughs> or, or go with a hat, I suppose. Yeah. But, <laughs> and we'll catch up next week. All right. Thanks, guys. Hey, everybody. If you're enjoying what you're seeing here, then follow along with Sakaris and Price on YouTube. I promise more content coming. They call it, the kids call it subscribe on YouTube. Well, how about liking it? Do that as well. Smash it right now.